Um, okay, I mentioned earlier we saved the best to last, and over to another guru, um, Sarah Jakes, who has often been the voice of reason from the floor at these conferences in the past, or indeed uh, on the panel. So I'm really pleased that you're giving uh, the summit today. Sarah Jakes from the new Nicotine Alliance. So I have the unenviable task of trying to represent the views of three million different people. <laughs> so all off the back of my iPad with no slides, so wish me luck. So four years ago, almost to the day, I was sat at the back of this room vaping discreetly as requested and trying as hard as I could to be invisible. I'd only been vaping about six months, but I was already an active participant in a massive consumer mo uh, movement against EU regulations which originally were medicinal in every way except for name. Just a month before that first summit, vapors had succeeded in overturning the impending regulation and they did it simply with their stories. Thousands of people wrote to their representatives in the EU Parliament and told them about their switch from smoking to vaping and the improvements that that had made to their lives. In those days, we felt as if we had few, if any, allies. Huge multinational industries with vested interests in either smoking or smoking cessation were lobbying against us. Vocal members of the public health community were denying the truth of our experiences and even our very existence, things which we saw with our own eyes day after day. And yet here I was, sat in a room with hundreds of others, watching academics and other experts come up on this stage and say what we already knew, that vaping should be embraced not feared, and that it had the potential to change the lives of millions of people. Passionate vapours are a diverse crowd, as I'm sure some of you have seen. But we all do have some things in common. We want to share our experiences, and we want to protect something that we love. We also want to ensure that other people have the same opportunities to make the choices that we made when the time's right for them. We want lawmakers to understand why that regulation that they think is such a wonderful idea really isn't. We understand this because we created this. It was vapors who took the original e-cigarette, pulled it apart and turned it into something that works. Through thousands of informal channels like forums and YouTube reviews, we pushed industry to improve the designs and the options on offer, and we still do that today. The independent vaping industry has always been incredibly sensitive to the needs of consumers, and you know why? Because they're us. The only difference between us is the fact that their enthusiasm took them the extra step of setting up in business. So when you see our rowdy revolution, remember that what you're seeing is, trying, is people who are just trying to stop you from fucking it all up. <laughs> in order to do that, some of us have had to take an extra step. We've had to become almost full-time unpaid advocates. And the challenges for consumer advocates in this area have been massive and often overwhelming. We're all ex-smokers, and let me make this clear, we're resentful of the way that smokers are treated. We naturally rail against coercive methods of forcing smokers to quit, and we detest the stigmatisation of smokers that always goes in hand, hand in hand with those uh, policies. And yet we congratulate and we support those who make the switch from smoking to vaping, just as public health might anybody who su successfully gives up smoking. So it could be said that our goals are the same, but our ideas about how we get there are often very different. Because of these differences, getting a seat at the table has often been difficult. In the UK, NNA has been really lucky to have the support of Public Health England, and that's opened a great number of doors for us but it's also caused suspicion within the vaping community. In my time in advocacy, I've been called a troll, a tobacco shill, and a brain-damaged addict, and that's just by people in public health. <laughs> and at the same time, I've been accused of being in cahoots with tobacco control by people on my own side of the fence. Of course, none of those things are true, but they certainly make life interesting. Many consumer campaigns are libertarian and pro-choice in nature, and vaping certainly no exception. The phrase, just bugger off and leave us alone, screams through my head on a regular basis. The freedom to choose what we want to do with our own bodies is very important to us, and it's being eroded. But vaping's more than just a pro-choice campaign. 
While many vapors do regard it simply as a more pleasurable alternative to smoking, many others place greater importance on the reduction of harm to their health or the ability to use e-cigarettes to stop smoking. It's really not easy to represent all of those views without getting criticism from one direction or another. But these things aren't mutually exclusive. If vaping's a pleasant alternative to smoking, then people who choose to switch, or people who take up vaping instead of smoking, are minimising the harm that they do to themselves, whether or not that was their intention. And this is why engagement between vapors and public health is important for both sides. For public health, vaping should be an important harm reduction tool. But like all tools, it won't work unless you know how and when to use it. And for us, it won't work if public health tried to turn it into something that it isn't. So what isn't it? The word pleasure seems to be something of an anathema for some in public health. One of the biggest challenges for consumers is in getting regulators and those who advise them to understand that for a great many people, vaping is not a medicine and it's not simply a smoking cessation intervention. It works precisely because it isn't those things. It works because they enjoy it. They love the personalisation that's possible from the uh, diversity of devices in the market and the thousands of flavours available. They enjoy the identity of being a vapour and the sense of community that that entails. They love that vaping is similar to smoking, but at the same time it's a million miles away from it. But it's important to remember that for many people, vaping is purely functional. They can't or don't want to spend a lot of money on the devices. They're not interested in personalisation and they certainly don't want to be a part of our community. They just want something that works. To them, all the choice can be, a de uh, can be a daunting prospect and they may find the whole vape culture intimidating, and I do too sometimes. For some of those people, a good vape shop can make all the difference because they can try out products with the assistance of real-world expertise and support. But for others, the answer may be the confidence that an e-cig-friendly stop-smoking service can offer, where they can receive impartial advice together with be uh, behavioural support. If public health truly wants to maximise on the benefits of vaping, it must recognise all of these experiences as equally valid and equally valuable, as must industry. Both should be asking themselves, what can we add, not what can we restrict? And start asking the right questions, not does this work, but why does this work and how can we make it work for more people? Talk to vapours, listen to and learn from their experiences, Get a better understanding of what motivates people to smoke and to vape, and here's a hint, it's not all or mostly about addiction. And talk to smokers, find out what the barriers are to switching and work out how to help them overcome them if that's what they want to do. There are already researchers working in these areas, but their voices are being lost in the cacophony of politicised junk science press releases that grab the headlines every day. One area where public health really does need to up its game is public perception, and I don't just mean on relative risk. Tobacco control policies have led to stigmatisation of smokers on a scale that just wouldn't be accepted against any other minority. The public hates smokers, and now it hates vapours. Not because they believe the vapours harmful, but because to them, vapours are just those awful smokers getting around the rules, and they're not even getting horrid diseases to... Punish them, for their <laughs> punish them for their bad habits. This sort of prejudice has led to widespread restrictions on vaping, despite the fact that there's no statutory ban in this country. Many vapors don't want the public support, just as people who have or who are trying to give up smoking. We're used to the fact that the public, the public has no sympathy for smokers or ex-smokers. But what vapors want is a lot more tolerance of something that just barely affects anybody else. Vapors are on the whole perfectly capable of working out where vaping is and where it isn't appro appropriate and also of being considerate. But why should they have any respect for organizations such as the numerous NHS trusts who despite the fact that they apparently supported the recent Stoptober campaign which included e-cigarettes as an option, <laughs> place a blanket ban on vaping even in outside areas? <laughs> and it doesn't stop with them. If, if you want to look at the abysmal, abysmal efforts of local authorities, then please find Andrew Allison, who I believe here is here somewhere, 
who brought out a report two days ago um, via the Freedom Association about their policies. But what message do these policies send to smokers? Why should they believe that vaping is any less harmful than smoking if vaping is treated in the same way? And why would any smoker consider switching from one restricted and despised activity to another one? They may as well just carry on smoking. One of the biggest divisions between consumers and public health, and also within public health itself, is the playoff between reducing harm for current and ex-smokers and preventing a new generation of nicotine users. All too often, it's clear that the choices which adults make, whether they be for reasons of health, wealth or pleasure, are considered less important than theoretical and most likely minimal risks to theoretical future children who theoretically may take up vaping. <laughs> Many consumers would question why a new generation of nicotine users is even a problem, seeing as there's no credible evidence that a gateway to smoking exists. And the world just doesn't seem to have a problem with the new uptake of similar stimulants, such as caffeine. Of course, in absolute health terms, it's likely to be better to not inhale anything other than good, clean mountain air, unless you're asthmatic. <laughs> <laughs> or drink anything other than spring water, or eat anything other than a perfectly balanced diet which probably involves cow smoothies. But out here in the real world, many of us don't want to live like that. We want to enjoy the time that we've got. We want to enjoy a nice chilled glass of Sauvignon Blanc without thinking about breast cancer. We want to be able to take our kids to see the spectacle of the big red lorry at Christmas without being branded irresponsible parents. We want to be able to make our own choices based on accurate information and we want public health messaging to just stop sucking the enjoyment out of everything that, for us, makes life a little bit less dull. But there's more to this story. In every area I've just mentioned, there are people whose ultimate goal isn't to inform or educate the public or even to nudge them into making better choices. There are people in influential positions in tobacco control who are so determined to destroy the tobacco industry rather than allow it to evolve or adapt that they'll do it at any cost, including the health and well-being of those who might otherwise uh, turn to safer alternatives. No doubt the tobacco industry is deserving of its reputation, but fighting their lies with your own lies leaves only consumers as collateral damage. Don't for one minute think you're doing smokers any favours if you lie about the safer alternatives just because the tobacco industry sells them. All of the major ca uh, tobacco companies are now investing in harm-reduced products, and yes, I know that they're still selling cigarettes and fighting tobacco control efforts around the world. But change, especially in an organisation as large and, and as complex as the tobacco industry, with its shareholders to answer to, takes time. And never forget that it's not just the industry who would have to transition to safer products, it's smokers too. And for harm reduction to be successful on the scale that public health would like to see, smokers have to want to. As America will find out if it continues on its current, sort, current course, you can't force them and nor should you. So if you must fight the tobacco industry, fight them with the truth. Make sure that their customers know that a safer alternative is available and where their customers go, they'll have to follow. Hold them to account. If they say they want their business to transition to safer products, make sure that they continue in that direction. But be pragmatic. This won't happen overnight, and it won't happen at all if you continually block them just because of the, who they are. So is it possible to engage at any level with the tobacco industry and remain credible? <coughs> all too often, we see good people with valuable alternative views dismissed not because there's anything wrong with what they're saying, but with the use of smears and innuendo concerning tobacco industry influence. Earlier this year, Derek Yak announced the formation of the Smoke Free Foundation, an organisation which, as we've heard, would basically take a billion dollars of PMI's money and use it to fund independent research into uh, harm-reduced products. Predictably, as we heard earlier from uh, Professor Etta, the idea has been panned by many in tobacco control. And also, predictably, the idea of PMI funding a smoke-free world hasn't gone down well with pro-smoker groups. The suspicion and antipathy on both sides is completely understandable, and it's right to be cautious. But if the foundation fails, it's once again the consumers who lose out. 
Well-funded studies with proper independent oversight are vital in empowering consumers to make an informed decision. They might also go a long way to counter the deluge of junk science that's constantly hitting the headlines. <coughs> Whilst giants like the FDA, the World Health Organization, and even the EU Commission are sinking huge amounts of resources into funding science to support their restrictive policies on harm-reduced products, other funders, like Cancer Research UK, do seem to be asking the right questions. And in the coming years, we should see some really good science come through. But for many people, this will be too little too late. The damage in terms of, of um, policy and public perception will already have been done. <coughs> Consumers are impatient for good quality science, and frankly, many of us don't care who pays for it. For us, tobacco control hasn't proven itself any more trustworthy in that area than the tobacco industry. Just think on that for a minute. And what of the media's schizophrenic treatment of e-cigarettes? Where does that come from? Is it any surprise that the public is confused about the risk that, that's posed by e-cigarettes when almost on a daily basis they alternate between miracle cure and the work of the devil? All too often, the reason for this seems to stem from two things, policy-based evidence-making and research impact scores. Combine those two things with the fact that journalists rarely have time to look beyond the press release and bad news sells newspapers better than good news and you have all the ingredients for a public health balls up on a monumental scale. But where is the accountability? When will someone pay for the harm that the scaremongering is causing by denying consumers a balanced and accurate view? Many countries, some of which are leaders in drug harm reduction, seem to struggle with the concept when it comes to tobacco. Similarly, the World Health Organization, despite the fact that it embraces harm reduction, certainly doesn't embrace e-cigarettes or any other tobacco harm reduction product that I can identify. We watch dumbfounded as this organization lords the actions of various notorious world dictators yet refuses to engage with the only stakeholders who actually matter, which is the consumers. To us, many policies around the world on e-cigarettes seem insane. And to vapors in countries outside of the UK, UK vapors must seem very lucky, and, and maybe we seem ungrateful. <laughs> Believe me, we're not, but we worked hard for it. But we see what could have been. We see the choices that are taken away from people by the arbitrary and counterproductive uh, restrictions on reduced risk products in the TPD. We see our smoking friends being put off of vaping by the appalling media coverage. And where policies are formulated that would punish smokers into switching to vaping, we see them becoming resentful and entrenched. The UK is without doubt a world leader when it comes to e-cigarette policy but it's yet to get to grips with um, other harm-reduced products. Snus is currently banned here, and watching the regulators circle around heat not burn is like watching a very wary cat sizing up its prey. <laughs> there are other practically harmless uh, nicotine products sold elsewhere in the world that aren't sold here because the manufacturers fear that the regulators are hostile. The recreational nicotine landscape is shifting in favour of public health, but the regulators are still resisting. Whatever your view on Brexit, it may, depending on the deal that we end up with, offer the UK the opportunity to revisit these regulations and replace them with something fit for purpose. Regulations which actually protect consumer safety whilst encouraging the innovation that will bring better and more attractive harm-reduced products, whether those products are tobacco or pure nicotine-based. The UK could show the world how a policy of embracing and supporting private sector innovation through appropriate regulation can improve the lives of millions, but has it got the guts to do it? It's made a good start with the tobacco control plan and the recent Stoptober campaign, but we're still shackled to some extent to the coercive policies of the past. And ideological resistance to harm reduction is still endemic in some areas. This is the fifth e-cigarette summit. By the sixth, I hope to see e-cigarettes as just one in a range of safer alternatives readily available to consumers, and I hope to see a lot more consumers finding them an attractive alternative to smoking. In order to achieve this, though, there must be greater acceptance of the uncomfortable truth for some, 
that these products are used first and foremost by a great many consumers in the pursuit of enjoyment. And smoking cessation is a welcome byproduct. By all means, reap those benefits for the goal of improving public health. But don't expect a bountiful harvest if you ignore the single most important factor in the success of vaping in creating ex-smokers so far, pleasure. Thank you.